Hi, welcome to Lecture 2 of Biology 101. I'm Ram Dizon, and I will be discussing with you frequency distributions as our basis for presenting data. When we present data in conferences or even in meetings, we, are, we have to make sure that the audience that we are presenting to are actually understanding what we are trying to tell them. So we have to make sure that the data is clear and organized. All of the trends and patterns that we are seeing are also seen by them, so we have to make them more obvious. And then the important variables that we are using for our conclusions are properly emphasized. There are various ways to present data, and the simplest one is by showing them a table, such as this simple table showing the relationship of temperature with the concentration of oxygen in water. Probably it will only take you 5.1 seconds to realize that the relationship of temperature and, and oxygen in water is an inverse relationship. As you increase temperature from 1 to 30 degrees, you are seeing a decrease in the oxygen of uh, in the oxygen concentration of uh, in fresh water as well as in seawater. So this is quite easy to understand because you only have a few data points. However, what if you have a more complicated table such as this one? I think it will take you a few hours to actually understand what is happening. So one way to condense all of these information and make them more readable, more understandable to our audience is by uh, presenting the data as a graph. There are different types of graph graphs. Uh, the first one, the most simple one, is the bar graph. These are just uh, rectangular uh, things that you see on the graph. And of course, the longest one would have to have the highest value. So it might take you like 2.3 seconds to realize that your mosquitoes have the highest vibrations per second compared to the honeybee, the housefly, and the beetle. Okay, and then you also have line graphs. Line graphs are showing you values as well, but then uh, typically they relate to a, a temporal trend, uh, such as the population of rabbits and foxes as they respond to each other. You will take this up in ecology. And then you also have scatter plots. Scatter plots are simply graphs that have uh, points, which are combinations of x values and y values. And usually they tell us if there is a relationship between two variables or not, such as here, the body length in micrometers and the odontostyle length in micrometers. It's quite obvious in this graph, in this scatter plot, that as your body length increases, okay, there is that corresponding increase in the length of your odontostyle, whatever that is. Okay. Then we have pie charts. These are things that I'm sure you're quite familiar with because it's probably the way that you cut the pie which you share with your siblings and you get the biggest share. So of course, the largest share uh, tells us that that has the highest percentage in, in any uh, population. And then there's also the box plot, which is a bit more complicated, but then it is more informative because it will tell you where the median is, where so, some of the other measures like the quartiles are located, and then even the location or the value of the extreme values for, for the different groups that you're trying to compare. So because of all of these different graphs that are available to you, you have to know when to use which graph. So the key points here is make sure that whatever graph you use, that contributes to the clarity of your presentation, as well as to the comprehension of your audience. So I would like to show you uh, a hypothetical 
a data set which, which gives the mean heights of three groups of plants that were exposed to three combinations of like light and dark periods and they are measured after four days. So there are three groups of plants and then three combinations of light and dark periods. So I will show you uh, the data in different graph forms. One, we have the bar graph. Okay, so we have group one having the highest mean height or average height, and then uh, group two is the shortest. And then you have your 3D bar graph. It's very similar to your uh, simple bar graph, but the thing is, it has this uh, third dimension here. This is useful aesthetically in presentations, but then uh, if you really do not have that third dimension, I, I really advise that you don't use this because it's useless to have that third dimension without having that, I mean, without actually having a third set of variables for this. The third graph is your line graph showing the value of group one, group two, and group three, but we are connecting them with lines. I don't think this is advisable because one, there is really no relationship between groups one, two, and three. Okay, had it been a measurement of a single group over time, between time one, time two, and time three, then I think the line graph would have been the most suitable uh, graph to use. And then the fourth one, it's a specialized type of graph. It's called an area graph. It just shows you the, the relationship or the, the value of something as it changes over time. And similar to the line graph, I don't think it's it's applicable. It's yeah. It's a. I don't think it's applicable in this situation because your groups one, two, and three are not related to each other. So this is not the graph to use. So among the four graphs, I think the bar graph would suffice and would be the best way to present your data. Okay. So our basis for our graphs and for our data would be frequency distributions. What are frequency distributions? These are simply tables that will show us and summarize to us the frequencies or the counts of values of particular categories in a sample or even in a population. So for example, out of 10 dithros, you have these outcomes, you have a three, you have a one, a three, a one, a four, a two, a two, a six, a three, a two, and a one. This is your raw data and it's not very organized. So uh, if you present it as a frequency distribution, you might want to present it like this in a more orderly manner. So you have your outcomes your die outcomes from one up to six, and then the frequency of the frequencies of those uh, outcomes. So you had uh, three times that you had, you rolled a one. You also had, you rolled out a two thrice. Uh, you rolled a three twice, etc. Okay, so the total is 10 throws. So this table is what, what we would now call a frequency distribution. And there are several pieces of information that we can derive from frequency distributions, which can be our basis for the different graphs that we can use to present our data. So if we represent them as a bar graph, you would immediately see, like it might take you just like 0.5 seconds to realize that the nests found on building eaves ha are the more the most numerous among among the four categories okay make sure that when you do a bar graph they are of equal widths okay that is quite important because you're trying to prevent uh, the creation of false impressions which i will exp explain later and also when you're making a bar graph make sure that it starts at zero 
Okay, I will make this point a bit more clear in a while. Here is the same data set, but then we did not start at zero. Look at the low tree branches category. There's that impression that there's there are almost none of the nests found. Uh, there are almost no nests uh, found there. But then actually there are more than 45 of them. Okay, simply because you didn't start at zero. How about an equal widths? Although the nests found on building eaves are are the most numerous, uh, the width of the nests on the vines and on the tree and building cavities might give that impression that there are uh, more of them than those on the building eaves. Okay, here's another example. This graph. Okay, instead of a bar graph, it's still a bar graph, but instead of bars, they are using uh, human images or caricatures. Okay, this is a listing or a graph of the average height of males in different countries. So you have uh, the Netherlands, the US, Canada, England, India, and the Philippines. Okay, look at their average heights. Is it true that we're just at the level of the knees of, of the Dutch? Of course not, okay? This is a bar graph that is giving us the wrong impression. Why? It is simply because it did not start at zero. Okay, a more proper way of presenting this information is by making sure that all of your graphs start at zero and the corrected graph should look like this. Okay, so we are not short after all, at least we're not that short. Okay, how about this one? It's a line graph that again might give you some false impressions. It is showing you the number of murder and homicide cases reported from 2010 until 2016. So we're seeing the totals like 12,000, 11,000, 11,000, 16,000, 13,000, 12,000, 5,000, and then 681. So what is this trying to tell us? It is trying to tell us that towards 2016, the number of murder and homicide cases were actually going down. But is that real? Notice the years. That's 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. Those are okay. But you have two 2016 data points here. And if you look closely below, this point represents six months not one year and this point represents only about a month okay so make sure that when you're making line graphs or any type of graph you do not give a false impression okay here's our example too we're looking at uh, a particular fish it's a freshwater fish your your sunfish and then we have divided them into different categories in terms of their pigmentation there's no black pigmentation faintly speckled moderately speckled heavily speckled and solid black if you would like to go to go back to lecture one what type of data scale is this this is ordinal scale type of data because it's all relative, okay? From no pigmentation to a solid black pigmentation. Okay. And then uh, it's also possible since this is ordinal, you can assign what we call dummy values to it. So we can start from zero and then one, two, three, and four. So it makes things numerical. So just know that if you have a four that is the darkest fish that you have 
Okay, so you have five different categories and you have the frequency of the number, uh, the frequency of fish that you have for every category. So there were 13 fish that did not have any pigmentation, 68 that were faintly speckled, etc. Okay, it's quite easy to see here that the, the faintly speckled fish were the most numerous, but then I think it takes you like 2.6 seconds. However, if you do a bar graph, it will take you like 1.2 seconds to realize that your uh, category one, your faintly uh, speckled fish, are, are the most numerous. Okay, here's my next example. We're looking at the ages of Bio 101 students. Uh, this was this was carried out before the K to 12. So you have a 16 year old who's a freshman. So it's easy to see here that it is the 18 year olds uh, who were in second year at that time were the most numerous. So this again is a simple table, but we can represent it as a vertical bar graph. So you have your 18 year olds as the most numerous. You can have your vert, uh, bar graph in this way, or you can ha have it lying down horizontally. So again, it's your 18 year old, 18 year olds that are the most numerous. Your next example, we have the ages of your bio one, bio one one students. It's the same as what we had a while ago, but then this time it's a bit more uh, informative. So we have, we divided the data into males and females for every uh, age category. Okay, so we can represent it in this manner. Okay, the blue uh, vertical bars represent the males, the number of males that you have in the class, and the red ones are for the females. So you can have a vertical bar graph, and you can also have a horizontal bar graph. This is easy to do in Excel. Okay, there is another way of presenting uh, this very informative uh, bar graph. It's called a stacked bar graph. Okay, where you have uh, the males and the females, uh, they're bar graphs are the bars are are right on top of each other so this gives you not only the the number of females and males per category but even you, you can get the total number like there are 12 17 year olds here so 18 plus 6 that gives you 24 uh, 18 year olds in the class Okay, so uh, it really depends on the purpose that you uh, or the information that you want to share with your audience. So you really have to choose what type of uh, graph that you can use for your for your presentation. Okay, and then you can also have a horizontal bar graph. Okay, so we have here a, a bit more complicated example we're looking at the number of plants with a particular number of aphids aphids on them okay so uh there are actually just two variables here it's just the number of aphids and the number of plants so this is just one continuous table like this okay so this should go on top of this and this should go on top of this there were 424 total observations and the number of aphids on the plants ranged between zero and if you look down here 41 okay so uh, how do you read this table Okay, there were, like here, there were five plants that had six aphids. If you go right next to it, there are 17 plants that had 20 aphids, and then there were eight plants that had 34 aphids. So this is, uh, this is your table. This is a very long table. It's quite complicated. If you make a bar graph of it, it can be a bit tedious to do, but I, I did it anyway. So we have it here, okay? 
this is okay but the thing is for you to make this uh, it might take a, a while for you to to finish doing your your vertical bar graph representing the number of plants that had a specific number of aphids uh, so what do you do when you have too many categories okay so for example what if you had plants that had 2,000 aphids, not just 41 or 42 aphids. So that would be a, a kilometric graph to, to do. Okay, so the key here is when you have too many categories, it's uh, trimming it down to uh, several groups without a significant loss of information. So things become less tedious to make but then how do we group them do we just group them arbitrarily well we have some suggestions on how to do grouping when you have a very tedious a very tedious data set okay there are grouping rules one if there are too many uh, categories again as i've mentioned they are too tedious uh i mean if you try to reduce it but not significantly reduced it okay it's still tedious and your uh, final list will be almost as long as your original data so uh, there's no fun in that okay but then if you have too few groups naman okay that can obscure the general shape of your data and you are losing significant information from your data set. Sayang naman, pinagpaguran mo yung, yung data set na yun. Okay, so the best way that we would like to recommend to you is uh, leave it to good judgment, but then we have this. Well, we call it the, well, I, I call it the 2 to the k greater than n rule, where n is the total number of samples that you have. And then K would be the ideal number of groups that you can uh, divide your data set into. Okay, so how do we use this? From our sample, there were 424 total uh, observations. Okay, so if we start with 2 to the 7th, okay, 2 raised to 7, you have 128, which is less than 424. So 7 groups is not ideal. If you have 2 raised to 8, you have 256. Again, it is less than 424. However, if you raise 2 to the 9, uh, to exponent 9, it's 512 and this is the value that just barely surpasses your total uh, number of samples so 9 in this case would be your ideal k so your 424 uh, observations can be divided into nine groups okay so after uh, going out of your way to compute for your k please make sure that you use this, that you actually divide your data set into nine groups. Okay, now that we know that our, that our ideal grouping is nine, what about the width of each group? What is the range of each group? So that is easy to compute for. Uh, we use W as the width of each class and uh, to compute for w we simply get the largest value okay and subtract from it the smallest value and then divide it by the number of classes or groups which you have already computed for and in our case it is nine uh, for the aphids uh, example the largest value that we had was 41 Remember, there were there were some plants that had 41 aphids on them, and there were also plants that did not have any aphids on them. So that is 41 minus 0 divided by 9, and you get a value, something like 4.556. But then that is so tedious. Let's just uh, 
round it off, round it off to the next uh, highest value, which is five. Okay, probably if you get a four point two eight here, I would still recommend that you round it off to five. So it's the next highest integer. Okay, so that is purely for convenience because it's easier to divide your data by five instead of by four point five five six. Okay, so let's do that for our data. So we have our nine groups here. Oops, uh, I'll try to erase that. Okay, okay, so you have groups one all the way to nine, and then we said that our width is five. Okay, so our group one would be composed of plants that have zero up to four aphids. So that's zero, one, two, three, four. Those are five groups, or I mean, uh, a range, that's a range of five, okay? And there are eight plants that had zero up to four aphids, etc. Okay, so you just fill up the rest of the table and you end up with a total of 424, which is equal to our n a while ago. So this is what we can now uh, plot as our bar graph. Okay, uh, by the way, I have this note here. Okay, for our uh, group 9, it's uh, the range is 40 up to 44, but our data says it's only up to 41 or 42. Uh, it's okay. As long as you, uh, as, as long as that data point is within within this range, para lang makompleto natin yung yung five na width, okay? So even if there are no plants that had 44 aphids in your data set, it's okay. Okay, so uh, I'm I'll just be a bit makulit. So K is nine, so you actually used the nine groups that you computed for and you were also using that width of five so that's zero up to four is five five up to nine is five okay etc so here is your simplified bar graph of the data set so you have here the range this is the width zero to four five to nine etc up to 40 up to 44 and then you have your nine groupings so if you compare this with the original data which is this it's quite similar you still see that that a uh, high value towards the middle and then the second highest value just uh, past the middle point okay so you, you see it here you also see it here and you're also uh, seeing it here in the simplified form. This is using the ideal number of groups. However, I would like to contrast it with this uh, a severely simplified representa representation of this group, of this graph. Uh, although we are seeing that that middle bulge here, but then we, we are not seeing this. So there is that loss of information. If we Put in I mean if we use too few groups okay so uh, I would still recommend that you use the K and the W when you're simplifying your graphs okay so you now have your your range like this is the the width okay and there's also the frequency the number of uh, measurements that you have that lie within this particular range. Uh, in this particular example, you have the phosphorus levels that were measured in leaves, that's milligrams of phosphorus per gram of leaf that was sampled, and you see the range here. There's 8.15 up to 8.25 milligrams of phosphorus per gram, all the way to 9.15 to 9.25 uh, milligrams of phosphorus per gram of leaf okay so we can already uh, represent this as a bar graph showing the range as well as the frequencies but then we can also derive something else from this data set okay we call it the midpoint it's simply 
this high value minus this lower value divided by 2, we get what we call the midpoint. So it's 8.2, 8.3, etc., all the way to 9.20. So you can actually use the midpoints instead of the range, okay, and plot them against the frequency, and you get this graph. Okay, it's a, yeah, I think it's still a bar graph, uh, but it's a specialized type of bar graph. It's now called a histogram. So what is the difference of a histogram from a bar graph? One, you don't see any gaps between the bars, unlike the bar graphs that we were using a while ago. And then instead of the range along the x-axis, we're seeing the midpoints. Okay, so that's the basic difference between a histogram and a bar graph. Okay, kulitin ko lang kayo. This is a bar graph. This is a histogram. What's the difference? Uh, wait, going back. How do I go back? Okay, well, I, I can't go back. So I'll, I'll just... Okay, remember that histogram. Okay, if you put a dot at the middle of each bar graph, or I mean each vertical bar in the histogram, okay, which represents the midpoint, by the way, okay, so you'll have this line graph. Okay, if you connect all of the dots, you now get a different type of graph, which we now call the frequency polygon okay so yeah that's just a note that says the points that you have here represent the midpoints of the bars in your histogram okay so you have the range you have the midpoint you have the frequency there is another set of information that you can extract from this table and these are what we call the cumulative frequencies okay you can either start with the low values or you can start with the high values if we start with the low values it's simply like this okay between 8.15 and 8.25 you have two of them so you write two okay and when you go higher it's simply this plus the number of frequency in the next category. So that's two plus six, you get eight. Eight plus eight, you get 16. 16 plus 11, you get 27, et cetera, et cetera, until you get the total number of measurements that you have in your data set, which is 130. So that is starting with low values. Okay, so how do you start with high values? You start with the total number of measurements. It's 130 minus the frequency at that level so 130 minus 2 gives you 128 minus 6 gives you 122 minus 8 114 minus how many 17 you get 103 minus 17 again you get 86 okay so you get that so we now can uh plot the midpoints versus the cumulative frequency you can have the low values or you can have those that started with high values and your your graph would something like this okay so this is another type of graph which we now call the cumulative frequency distributions this starts from the high values and this starts uh, from the low values Okay, uh, you're, you're not supposed to do both. You can just choose whichever, just, just one, just one of them. Okay, uh, your graph will begin or end with the total number of samples that you have in your items. In this case, it's 130. For this particular graph, uh, you started at 130, and this particular graph, you ended at 130. Okay, I hope that's clear. 
so what's the use of cumulative frequency distributions? This is still part of descriptive stats, but sometimes it it can be it can be uh, useful in a way. It can be used to assess uh, some things, uh, which I can show you in a while. Okay, um, it's good that I'm giving this lecture because this was my research. Um, I'm a marine biologist by training, and this was what we were using in 2006. Where were you and how old were you in 2006? Maybe you were still in diapers. Okay, I was in the middle of the ocean by then. Okay, uh, I would like to introduce to you a species of coral called Acropora muricata. It's uh, something that we have here in the Philippines. And uh, our research was we were trying to see uh, if some coral species, of several coral species, can actually uh, be used in uh, transplantation, okay, and that is, in essence, trying to uh, restore uh, coral reefs that were that were damaged in the Philippines. So we were trying to look at different species, and one of them was this uh, Acropora muricata, and we transplanted this small fragment, okay, uh, I'm using this one peso coin as my, as my reference. So this is a small fragment, and this is a larger fragment. The larger fragment is something like as big as your fist. Okay, so we were trying to compare how the smaller fragments and the larger fragments fare at, uh, at transplantation. So what we did was we took these branches and then we attached them to a hard substrate. And this was, we were using uh, a sort of an epoxy putty. Okay, it's almost the same thing that you use to, to fix your, the holes on your roof. Okay, so in January 2006, we, we attached a small branch of coral to a hard substrate using uh, epoxy putty. And then this was the same coral, which has grown a bit a few months after. Okay, so what are we seeing here? Aside from the additional branches that have grown, uh, notice this. this. These are what we call uh, attachment points. This is when we would think that the coral is on its way to establishing itself as uh, an individual colony. Okay, so notice here that you still see the adhesive uh, at the base of the coral, but then a few months after, you're now seeing nothing but live coral tissue growing over the adhesive and it's now attaching to the substrate. This is the point that which we record as the self-attachment period. Okay, so we, we just count the number of days from this point up to this point. Okay, so we also did this to the large fragments. You can see here the self-attachment points here at the base and then there was this small branch that was well pointing towards the substrate and it has now spread and self-attached. Okay, so we did this to about a dozen other coral species and we have these as our, well, just to show you what corals we were using. Okay, these were like uh, a year after or so and we were using cumulative frequency polygons, okay, to compare among the different species. We have this, okay. So instead of actual numbers, we were using percentage self-attachment, okay. So this is for uh, Acropora muricata. And then this is for several other species as that are listed here. Okay, what we were trying to look at was the 50% mark. Okay, we were looking at the intersection of this frequency, cumulative frequency polygon with a 50% mark. This is uh, what we were referring to as the halfway mark. This is the time at which 
half of the corals have self-attached. And, and this is quite informative because it is showing us uh, that the different species are self-attaching uh, at different times, okay? It takes longer for a few species to self-attach. Compared with a cropper that we were, we were using, if you just look at uh, the x-axis, it only took like about a month for half of the cropper corals to self-attach. While it took the others, like this one took about four and a half months for 50% of the corals to self-attach. Okay, and then there was also this strange species that never self-attached. This is a type of coral that doesn't really, it just follows the, the contour but doesn't really attach. Parang uh, hindi siya clingy, okay? Parang, yeah, you can be close but don't touch me. Parang ganon. Uh, but then, yeah, it's also a, a very common coral. So, there, we're just using graphical analysis and we're already are able to, to make or to detect differences among different corals. So that is the is one way of using graphs to analyze things. Okay, so this ends this uh, particular lecture. Thank you.